All right, we are going to go ahead and call this meeting of City Council to order at 7 o'clock. Um, let's uh, observe our traditional moment of silent reflection, followed by the pledge. Thank you very much. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As I said in the previous Stockard meeting, Randy, Amby, and I are extra patriotic today because that's the fifth time we've said yeah. the Pledge of Allegiance today. <laughs> you know how that goes. It's been a day of meetings here at City Hall. So um, we uh, would like to get through our agenda as uh, efficiently as possible this evening. So let's go ahead and move to our recognized guests. Um, we have Jacob Heyer and Brian Shaw that have signed in that wish to address the council tonight. Uh, do you, one or the other, or both of you, together? Yeah. Okay, if you could please approach the uh, podium, please. We, um, we are recording this meeting, so the microphone will be helpful for those who are watching and listening online. So, uh, good evening. Good evening, guys. I want to appreciate you guys for giving us your time. But we are really just looking to throw out there that we need more recovery options here in the county. Everyone that's a recovering addict has to travel hundreds of miles to get any help. And we'd really like to see more of that closer by, you know what I mean? We're both recovering addicts. I got two years, he's got over a year. So that's what we're here to address today. Okay, well, thank and you. Also, I'd like to, um, um, I know that there's grant money that comes in and it's supposed to be going into recovery. And um, there's supposed to be an inpatient uh, rehabilitation center that I've, I've called numerous people and tried to get answers, and I'm not sure what's going on there, but it's over at the Colonial. That, so Community Care of West Virginia has not officially um, released their uh, information regarding that property. Um, we have asked as well, um, but it is private property. As, as you know, Community Care does own the, the, the property. That is public knowledge because it can be searched on the through the Upshur County tax map. Um, but as far as their specific plan, they have not um, divulged that yet. That I know that they are working on it. Um, I, I do try to keep in pretty close contact with their CEO, Trish Collett, um, and I did before with Rick Simon, uh, but they, they are still finalizing their details and what they want to see happen at the property. That's, that's the best information we have at this time. We know it's coming. Um, we know they have an elaborate plan uh, established. We know that they're working with a third party uh, vendor that handles these types of facilities all over the country. Um, but as far as specifically what it looks like at Buchanan, we do not have that information yet. Yeah, that's what I've run into. <laughs> yeah. What, what's going on with Matt Kerner? Is that still in process or not? We don't have any information there. No information. Doug Spears also had a couple of houses? Yeah, he, there's yeah. there's the, I believe, the Lazarus house that's over on North Buchanan. So So as far as you know, Mr. Kerner's not doing this anymore? I, I don't I don't have any specific information. I don't know. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have any update. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe we need to find that out. It's good. Yes. Good. I'd appreciate it. Yeah. We, yeah, we we uh, we understand your 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 concerns and your uh, your points, and we'll. Yeah. Are you familiar with the opportunity house that Mr. Kerner had a number of years ago? Yeah, I'm not real familiar with it. I have talked to Matt, mm -hmm. um, but I did all my recovery out of town in Parkersburg, okay. and I'm still getting adjusted to Upshur County and Buchanan with the recovery. Okay. What, what brought you to Upshur County? Well, I was born and raised here. Okay. And then I went to Parkersburg for my treatment. I did long-term treatment mm -hmm. on the recovery point. And um, man, it is, it's great. Yeah. It's a great thing. It's brought me to where I'm at right now. Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm sure, sure, sure. Sure. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty tough from what I understand. Yeah, it's the toughest one in the United States. It's not just that, it's behavior modification. Okay. Um, if you're there, you, you take it serious. Yeah. And it, this is a very, very serious disease, and it's a problem. We all know that. Yeah. We, 
we definitely need to do something about it. Yeah. Well, I think many of us are trying. I know. You know, and uh, God bless you. That's the blood. But I would get a hold of Mr. Kerr and see what's going on there. Yeah. Because they were supposed to have some grant money and everything too. So I know these meetings that we attend in NA and AA um, and Smart Recovery. They are really growing. I mean, the numbers of people are are stacking up, and they said they've never seen this much in turnout, and that, that stands out to me. Yeah. And I appreciate you guys letting us speak on this, and hopefully right. we get something, something well, wrong. Maybe we could have, invite Matt and Doug both, I can't, I think they're the only two entities that I'm aware of in our town, right. and invite them to the next council meeting to maybe give an overview of services that are available. There's a lot of churches. I know Cornerstone, and who was the gentleman you just mentioned? Doug Spears. Doug Spears, his church, right? Yeah. They're doing Celebrate the Covers, yeah. which is a tremendous program. Yeah, we're more talking about like inpatient and outpatient programs. Yeah, I, I think it, I think that the, the the project that Community Care is working on is really yeah. right up the alley of what of what they're mm -hmm. speaking. I, I think yeah. it would be helpful maybe if we were if if we could kind of get some sort of an idea of a timeline as to what you know what this looks like on their on their part um I, I can i can reach back out to to community care last we spoke about this was within the last month but you know i, I don't have any up-to-date as of today information so but congratulations to both of you on on your journey we know it's um it's it's certainly not an easy uh journey so um we we congratulate you and um we uh, will work we'll we will um, work with the partners that are um, that are stepping forward with the with the funding uh, to see what uh, what we can do. Okay. Thank you. All right. I appreciate. It. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here. Okay. This is my first meeting. Katie has one. I just wanted to share some news. Okay. I'm with Bible Canada. We just got a news release today from the um, Palatine Foundation that actually said that um, they're giving like sixty thousand dollars in grants to organizations. And one of them is actually our one unique recovery house, like more than $8,674. And they're going to be like purchasing items to make that. Now, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but they just got an $8,000 grant. And I just got the press release on that today. Right. Um, I'm so, not like trying to downplay it. But. No, I just wanted to share that because I know it's, I don't, I know it's yeah. one of those facilities. And I, I, I know it's not like, I know the difference between like an intensive a sober living situation versus like a detox. Right, yeah, right. Um, and I don't know if what you were referring to, but I mean, I do know they just got like almost $8,600. Okay. So. Mean, better than nothing. But like, I was just gonna say, like, I, I did a uh, outpatient rehab myself, do a methadone clinic. Mm -hmm. I'm two months clean off of methadone now after I tapered down. And they were charging my insurance $1,200 a week. Oh my so yeah. in comparative, you know, it's not even a whole year treatment. Yeah. I know. Well, I just wanted to share that because right. I, mean, I don't know if that I will change anything with them. Anything, no. Oh, no, no, no. I just wanted to pass it along. It's the first time here, too. So. <laughs> well, keep, moving, keep moving forward. Thank you. Can I, just, oh, yes. Can I go, uh, spell your names for you, please? Make sure I credit you all correctly. Uh, H Y R E Jacob. Okay. I'm Brian Y S H A W. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you, Joseph. Have a good day. Be safe. God be. All right, Meredith, good evening. How are you guys? Good, well, well, how are you? Good, ending the semester. <laughs> um, so we're on the home stretch to finals and graduation with lots of events scheduled. So the spring football orange and black game will be on April 19th. Greek week and its festivities will begin next week can take place over parts of two weeks with the accumulation of spring sing on April 20th. There is a young alumni reunion on April 20th, so we hope to have a lot of guests visiting. Um, the Athletics Hall of Fame induction is on April 20th as well. So while this meeting is happening, there are students gathered for a roundtable discussion about adverse childhood experiences. Many of the students in attendance are volunteers in schools and early childhood education centers throughout the county. Um, we believe that by learning more, we can be better volunteers to our youth. 
the We Lead Poverty Reduction Team partnered with Heather Schneider from Free, from Free Meals Appalachia to educate and raise awareness about the harmful practices behind dollar stores and how these practices affect the communities and the community members they target. The We Lead Human Rights Team hosted an instructive letter writing workshop empowering students with the skills to engage in legislative adv advocacy and pr prompting active involvement in shaping policies on issues they care about resulting in 10 letters being mailed and providing digital resources for further letter writing. Um, you will see students working on two upcoming community events, Boucher County Public Library Ramp Dinner and the Literacy Volunteers Book Sale, so we hope to see your support. The We Lead High Tunnel on campus is in this active growing season. They are hosting work days where participants relieve stress by moving dirt, planting plants, sowing seeds, and more. Music was always played, and there were occasional offerings for free food and merchandise. The items grown in the high tunnel will provide fresh produce for the Upshur Parish House. Um, concert Corel will be hosting a Corel alumni event with a performance on April 27th. Please see our website for the dates of all spring athletic contests and support our student athletes. And then 2024 to 2025 academic calendar is posted on the college website. Businesses may want to consult um, the website for dates and important events like orientation and homecoming. And I have included the calendar in my comments for the city to record and include in the minutes. I'll send those to the both media folks too. Okay. Share those with your media. Sure. Thank you. Any questions? How was Easter dinner? Did you eat it in Latin for the big Easter dinner? No, I didn't. Oh. I, my mom made it. <laughs> well, that's even better. <laughs> now, you're, you're a freshman, right, Mary? Yes. You going to see us again next year? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> What's your major again? Philosophy and Public Service and a minor in Legal Studies. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Yeah. You have a good summer. You too. All right, um, Jerry, I was a softie and decided to give him the night off. Um, he uh, didn't have anything new to report, except for I will, I will share that um, work has, uh, has begun on the city park. Um, we've had a, park, a spring parks and recreation board meeting, um, and uh, so they are working currently on the drainage system on the western side of the park. And then they will be beginning to lay out the uh, pickleball courts and the new basketball court and then pave uh, the road network uh, inside the park. So uh, lots of uh, activity at the city park. So if you are planning to visit the park, um, please understand that there will be uh, ongoing construction in that area as we work to improve it. So, And potholes are uh, being worked on throughout the city. We are, uh, the, the plants are opening up for uh, blacktop and uh, we, are, we are in line with every other municipality in North Central West Virginia, uh, trying to get the, uh, the, the material, the wearing to fill the potholes. So we are, uh, we are working on those uh, throughout uh, the, municipal, the municipal corporate limits. And um, finally, uh, it was brought up at Consolidated Public Works Board, but if you have a sidewalk that immediately abuts the street in front of your house or business and there and the sidewalk is full of uh, salt and cinders uh, left over from the winter time you can go ahead and use a shovel use a broom get you can go ahead and put those uh, cinders and uh, debris out into the street uh, our street sweeper will be coming by to clean uh, all of that up <laughs> as we prepare for the springtime. I noticed up on Kanawha Hill, uh, several had already uh, taken care of that. And so you may notice larger piles of rock in the street, but our street sweeper will be coming through once the uh, monsoon uh, stops uh, on us here. So uh, please do that if you live on streets like Florida, uh, where the street and or, or canal where the street uh, and the sidewalk come together uh, right right there um, with no grass in, in the median 
So that's, that's basically the public works uh, report for the evening. We will now go to the finance report. Amby. Hello. Hi, Amby. Hey, I'll give you your balances for the general fund uh, money market and checking six hundred ninety two thousand one ninety nine with the CD it's still at eighty six thousand historic landmarks three thousand thirty dollars Stockard Youth Center capital campaign we had a uh, hundred dollars uh, contributed each of the last two months by uh, Council McCauley so we've added two hundred dollars to that uh, balance that with the pledge is four hundred fifty seven thousand three ninety eight. Uh, coal tax 47,755. The municipal stabilization fund is at 924,000. Flood control is at 78,000. Consolidated public works 151,000 for the money market and checking, and the CDs at 235,000. Sales tax is at 1,809,000. The American Rescue Plan account is. Uh, you can see reducing we're getting quite a bit done on those water and sewer projects so we've got 434,000 left in that then the opioid account uh, that grant money that these gentlemen were sort of referring to we have $113,000 in that um, the March uh, 24 general fund revenues and expenditures the revenues were 462,000 the expenses were 529,000 the Stockard activities is uh, attached to my report. Um, in general, all, all of the activities that they had, there were 1,800 attendees throughout the month of March. And at the Colonial Theater, there were two um, events held there. One was the Buchanan uh, Upshur Middle School Theater Club. They held four small shows there uh, for three days with about a total of 180 people attending. And then the BU High School Choir, Jazz, and Orchestra held a fundraiser there for one evening. And it was uh, around 80 people in the audience plus 40 students attending. So it took up all of our seats, but a very few. And that's all I had for my report. Oh, wait. Um, in your bills to be approved, someone's <coughs> noting Stryker Flex Financial, the Life Pack lease payment was $7,000, Capital Electric. Uh, for the Gateway West Light Project, we expensed $12,251. Dave Hartley would purchase the projector for the CAC, and then lights for the CAC and event center was $4,300. Um, and then Webster on store, uh, re oven replacement at the Stalker View Center was $3,384. That's all I have. All right. Any questions for Andy? Thank you. Thank you, David. Chief Kimball. How are you all sitting? Oh, well. How are you, sir? Good. I'd like to, uh, Amy just spoke about the $7,000 lease payment on the Life Pack 15. That Life Pack 15 was used Friday in its full capacities, and there's a guy walking around today because of that Life mm -hmm. Pack, so um, that's a good piece of equipment. So, uh, in your packet, uh, the, the year to date and the month of March uh, runs basically breaks down into percentages and I, I want to make note to council um, last year the state legislature passed a tax um, reimbursement to volunteer firemen firefighters uh, if they maintain 30 percent of call volume that a fire department runs so if one of our volunteers if they could obtain 30 percent of our responses in the year of 2023 they get a thousand dollar tax credit towards their income tax. Well, at the Buchanan Fire Department, that's, over, that's about 480 calls a year, and it's it's not a, a really an obtainable uh, uh, goal to go for because we had zero of our volunteers that could make that amount of calls. Now, if you're in a, a smaller volunteer fire department where there's 30, 40 calls a year, you know, you're only talking nine to 15 calls a year. So. Sometimes legislature puts stuff in place to help volunteer firemen, firefighters, but the busier like us, Elkins, Weston, you know, some of the busier fire departments, it's it's very rough to make that. There was a bill in the legislature this year, if, if a volunteer firefighter would make 75% of the call volume, you'd be exempt from state income tax. Well, somebody would have to live at the firehouse to make 900 calls in a year or so for the Buchanan Fire Department to obtain that. Plus, the fire chief would have to sign saying that that was uh, what they did and, and it, against penalty of law if I forged that. <laughs> so 
that probably is not going to happen. So I want you to look at these percentages, and I, I really want you to look at the call volume that we go on. Um, so at the end of the year, when you're looking at 30% of the Buchanan Fire Department, you're looking at over 400 calls a year, typically, for an individual. That's more than one a day for a volunteer fire to, fighter to make to obtain those uh, requirements the state's putting forth. So just a little heads up on that. Um, so what, what should we do? Well, I, I think the, the problem that I see, especially the state doesn't realize it, you know, when they put in the, the code that they made, it's all calls. A fire department is traditionally only typically responsible for fire and rescue calls. Okay, so when you add in trees down and power lines down and you know, emergency medical calls and everything else, well, if you have a volunteer firefighter who's not an EMT, they're not going to respond to your medical calls unless they have to. And so those are calls that should not be involved in that situation. Just what a traditional fire department should respond to, um, you know, you look at those numbers and we can break that down very easily. So, Do you have a lobbying group? Do the fire departments have so, a lobbying group that well, can speak to the legislature? Yes, it's, that's, uh, it's the Volunteer Firefighters Association. And have the lobbying group, right? And they lobby for them. That's what they got. So that's so. what they got. Have they, have they even decided to do anything about this? No. This is for a personal tax credit, yes. right? Yes, okay. this is a thousand dollar personal tax credit that if you owe the state money at the end of the year for income tax, they will let you get up to a thousand dollars to put towards what you owe the state. It's not like they're handing you a thousand dollars. It just makes it available if you owe the state income tax, if you make that 30%. So if you take, you know, uh, some of the smaller volunteer fire departments that run even a hundred calls a year, you're, you're, that's 30 calls. So that'd be less than three a month, where Buchanan, Elkins, Weston, you're looking at 35, 40 calls a month. Yeah. So, so it's a whole different animal depending on the size of the fire department. So I wanted to make you all aware of that. Well, I, I, I think we ought to uh, try to do something about that and talk to our delegates and so forth. Yes. I mean, they're making codes and statutes sometimes that are not very good. Yes, they don't have I, I think, you know, issues. when you look at the, the whole uh, situation of fire departments, you know, that there should be more available to recruit and retain volunteer firefighters at this point. Than, well, they than, had good intentions, but they didn't do it. Yes, that. yes. So, uh, as you go on down through the packet, uh, the, uh, the breakdown of calls, uh, we had 82 responses in the month of March, had five fires. Um, 52 rescue emergency medical calls, four hazmat, no fire, hazardous condition, no fires, two service calls, 13 good attempt, and six false alarms, which would be like alarm investigation delays or situations like that. So, And we had three building fires out of those five, and up to date this, so far this year, we've had eight building fires. So moving on, um, I'm going down the list here all kinds of data. Um, I also put in your packet, uh, I presented, uh, sent out in a Google Doc to the uh, accreditation uh, committee, our uh, gap analysis for 2023, uh, which is our responses for three types of incidents. I added one, which was just to show a different timeline. Um, so this breaks down, you know, f fires, which are any type of fire, car fire, brush fire, house fire, uh, large building fire. So you, when you look at A shift call taking time, that is the 911 center. Okay, when you look at A shift first due fires, their call taking time is one minute and six seconds. When we started the accreditation process, it was three minutes, over three minutes at call taking time. But by us meeting with them on a regular basis now, we've, get, we've made the uh, time a lot shorter by uh, simplifying the questions they ask, simplifying a lot of the stuff they address when the person's calling. So when you look at this and when you go clear down to A shift responses to a scene, you know, it'll say uh, the first, first two fires is nine minutes and 29 seconds. That's the 90th percentiles. That's not an average. 90th percentile is what the accreditation model uses. An average is what you do most of the time. 90th percentile is pretty much a given. And so when you look at our first due, we're on fires on a shift, which we have three shifts, 90% of the time in under 10 minutes, uh, or 11 minutes, I'm sorry. 
I'm looking at here, the response time is nine minutes, and realize how far we're going out. Our first due goes to the county line west, to Hartman Road east, to Turkey Run north, and to Lake Run south. And probably the, the most time consuming is going south towards the high school. So that's, that's just the way we look uh, at, at response times. And one of these days in the future as our community grows and beyond my time, and probably beyond, beyond all our times, if we ever had to put other stations out, you'd start looking at where your time is absorbed responding to calls. So, but other than that, that's for you all to look at. And if you had any questions, you can stop by and I can pull anything up on the computer you want me to. JV, have you had any conversation with St. Bill Hamilton about the situation that you started out the meeting with? with the no, I haven't. Calls? Um, that was put in place last year and and i was not involved that this the state volunteer fire association was and the the problem is to most of the volunteer fire departments that's a win yeah. uh, to us and, and communities like similar to ours it, it's very difficult for any of our volunteers to make that and i'll give you an example i spoke to a chief of colton they had i think it was five members out of 25 that, that could obtain that so there is there is there are some departments that can utilize that, but for us it's it's almost impossible. And I you know I think it really needs to look, be looked at and look at what we're responsible for and 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 what we we are doing on a regular basis. And when you throw medical calls in on non medically trained people or individuals or members, they're not going to respond to those unless we're out busy doing something else and we need assistance. Then they'll come and help. So it's just. It, they're trying. I just think they get, you know, the state legislature, of course, this year being a, an election year, they were trying to throw things to make them stick. So that's kind of what I see. But, um, but yeah, if I have the opportunity, I will reach out to, uh, especially now that it's election year, to find out if there's any future plans of changing anything. So. I mean, just the way your numbers go, virtually all of our volunteers would have more call responses than probably any of the volunteers of the other five agencies in the county. Oh, yes. Probably combined. Yeah, combined. probably yeah. combined. That's right. Combined. Yes. Combined. And it's, it's just not achievable for, for a candidate volunteer. Not department. with that current formula, but if it could be an and or kind of a formula where it's based upon the quantity of calls or yes. the percentage of, you know, that, it just seems like there's, I don't know, Tom might want to comment about this it's almost like an equal protection issue where our firefighters and Elkins and other major volunteer agencies that have hundreds of calls a year they're being discriminated against yes. versus an agency that only has the 50 to 100 calls a year yes yep. and, and those agencies as the state looks at it an agency that runs 100 calls gets the same funding as the department that runs a thousand calls so and my comments aren't to begrudge the, the no, 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 and I'm not, but it budget. should be made available. If, if they're an active firefighter for your region, they that should be an acceptable thousand dollars for them to look at. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Because so, they, they spend more time. I mean, you know, when you look at the percentages our volunteers are making, if they're making 20% of our calls, they're making more responses for our community here than the rest of the departments have in an annual basis. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks, Thanks JB. Thanks, Thanks sir. No Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we've got some uh, matters on strategic to discuss that we'll deal with at the appropriate time, but there are a couple other matters I just wanted to make sure that we brought to uh, Council's attention. Um, Specifically, uh, well, on a, a zoning-related matter that uh, came to my attention earlier today, I uh, received um, an inquiry, or uh, one had been received uh, here at City Hall from a local property owner who is uh, who would like the city to consider uh, changing the zoning ordinance in order to allow Airbnbs uh, to locate in the R1 zone. Um, obviously, it's not anything the council can take uh, action on tonight, but it is a, kind of in the form of a, of a not really a 
petition, but it was a it was an inquiry that was made that uh, I pass along to the council just for its con uh, its consideration. Uh, the um, the email that came in making the request, uh, you know, laid out the you know potential pros and cons. I'm not here by any means to suggest that that's uh, a policy choice the council should. Uh, should entertain or not entertain, but uh, it is one that uh, it is a request that came in. If the council is of a mind, the process, of course, is to make a referral to the planning commission. They would consider it and it would come back. Um, in any event, just something to uh, just something to consider uh, moving forward. And if uh, the council is of a mind to to investigate that at all, we could certainly uh, do that. Um, I know there has been uh, on another zoning matter. There's been uh, some. Uh, continuing interest in the College Avenue uh, appeal down to the circuit court that technically right now it is set for hearing on April 30th however the uh, property owner has asked for a, a continuance uh, of that case the court has not ruled on that yet I don't have any particular objection to um, to uh, you know humoring the the property owner with uh, with that delay but uh, we'll keep you informed as uh, things move along with that um, we received uh, some guidance from the uh, Ethics Commission. It came in a little too late to get this in your packet. I don't know if uh, any of you have seen that. It has to do with uh, some guidance from the Ethics Commission on executive sessions and how they are noticed uh, on the agenda. Um, for what it's worth, I don't feel like the Council's um, current practices are deficient. Uh, in any way, I think we're doing things, uh, you know, pretty much the right way. I think there may be some minor tweaks that we could uh, do to our agendas, and I'll uh, I'll discuss that with uh, Teresa. Just some very minor, uh, minor just, things. Just to clarify, that wasn't sent specifically to us. No, yeah, yeah, no, I want to make sure everyone no, understands. Newsletter. This is yeah, a newsletter news from the Ethics Commission. It's sure. a broad, it's a broad brush. They did not, they're not coming. We, we're not doing anything wrong. That's right. It's just some, some. You know, FYI, the more you know, kind of thing. It's a monthly. It's a monthly publication. This was just yeah. the subject of the month. Yeah. So, uh, but we'll, um, like I said, I feel like we're in compliance uh, with uh, with code and how we kind of do things. But uh, but we could, but we can make a couple minor tweaks. Not a big deal. Um, and uh, I think that's about it. Actually, well, if you're of a mind, I, um, Mayor, you and Mr. Sanders said fielded a question to me uh, earlier this morning regarding uh, uh, the county commission and their uh, meeting. I have I have an answer for you on that. The uh, county commission uh, is required under state code, a state Supreme Court opinion from uh, 1958 and a 1977 attorney general's opinion uh, to hold all of their meetings in the county courthouse. Uh, whenever they are meeting as a county commission, they're required to do so uh, in the courthouse. For what that's worth, I just report back to you on uh, on that question, and uh, I'll be back up for uh, for strategic unless there are questions. Yes. Can you give us an update on where the college city oh, property um, yes. is? Thank you for uh, for mentioning that. I am meeting with Dale Bennett tomorrow morning uh, down at Westland. He was surveying the uh, rail trail, and uh, based on some of the instruction that uh, we had uh, given him uh, after consulting with the college, there's a uh, it's kind of a hang up with uh, the soccer practice fields and how that would, how the survey would impact down there. So I'm going to meet him on site tomorrow and we'll try to kind of work out the details. But I'm hopeful that uh, this means that we are very close to getting our survey plat from uh, Mr. Bennett uh, in the very near future. Then we'll be able to kind of close this transaction out. Is the college still paying the rental, monthly rental amount, do you know, on the street garage property? I don't know that. I think so. Okay. Tom, on the uh, continuance on College Avenue, how long would that continuance be? It would be up to uh, it would be up to the court. Uh, to it the could court. be a couple weeks. It could be you know a month or two. Because I mean, this has been I know this has been going on for four years now. Yeah, way too long. It's yes. just ridiculous, and it's you know it's it's very disturbing. I agree. Very disturbing. I agree. And. Uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks. Thank you, Tom.
All right, um, under correspondence of information, um, a couple weeks ago, I had the honor of uh, presenting a uh, proclamation uh, for Max Adams Day. Max is a uh, World War II veteran who is 100 years old uh, in our community, and uh, he, is, uh, he does very, very, very well for himself. You're shaking your head because you're a neighbor of him. I, 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 know, I notice here on, on, on the street. Um, but uh, it was at the Masonic Lodge, and uh, he was a very interesting uh, guy. He said that the secret to longevity is uh, birthday meals at Muriel's. So <laughs> I wholeheartedly concur with that. Absolutely. As someone who has my birthday meals at Muriel's, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have me around for a long time. Yeah. So, uh, but that's uh, that was a, a good time uh, with uh, Max Adams and. Uh, Outside of not being able to see the greatest, the man can hear very well, and his mind is sharp as a tack. So, what did you say? yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> My hair is off. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Notice of special city council lay the levy meeting. We have to do this exercise every single year on the same day, the same time. That will be Tuesday, April 16th uh, at 9 a.m. here. It'll literally take about 30 seconds. Um, and then we've got the report of the cat and dog activity for the Upshur County Commission, February 2024. And, and uh, remember, last city council meeting, we canceled uh, the city council meeting for May 16th um, due to conflict with the West Virginia Strawberry Festival. So our only meeting in May will be the very first one. Uh, under the consent agenda, we have some good news. Yeah. Mr. Sanders is totally caught up. So under E1, you see minutes for 3 5, 3 21, 2 14, 3 12, and then the joint city county or city council and planning commission meeting um, uh, back in January. So good job. Thank you. Um, having that event center manager is uh, yeah, pay, right. paying off paying already. Off, that's right. Uh, and then we've got the approval of the payment of our uh, bil uh, building permits, uh, or I'm sorry, approval of uh, payment of our bills. Thank you. That's what I started to say. Um, that I would like to entertain a motion that we approve the consent agenda E1 and E3 because we need to break out E2. Mm -hmm. So is there a motion to uh, approve E1 and E3? So moved. Motion by Jack. Is there a second? Second. Second by uh, Thomas. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Likes unopposed. Motion carries. Now for E2. Mr. Rigger needs to abstain. Uh, is there a motion to approve the building and wiring permits? So moved. Motion by Mr. Sanders. Is there a second? Second. Second by Thomas. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Likes unopposed. Motion carries with uh, noting the abstention of Mr. Rigger. Okay. Um, under strategic issues for discussion and or votes, we bring back uh, Mr. O'Neill. Um, we uh, have two ordinances to consider tonight, uh, 467 and 468. As you'll recall, uh, council uh, unanimously uh, directed Mr. O'Neill to begin drafting um, uh, two ordinances, one to increase the city's fire protection fee, this will be on first reading, and then one to uh, increase the city's police protection fee, that would also be on first reading. Uh, so I would defer to Mr. O'Neill to begin with 467 relative to the city's fire protection service fee. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll read. Um, I'll read each. Um, I'll read each ordinance by caption in turn, um, if that's all right, and then we can discuss the substantive uh, issues related to each. Uh, so first, with the uh, fire fee, the ordinance. So the council has before it ordinance number four six seven of the city of Buchanan, an ordinance amending ordinance number three ninety of the city of Buchanan, increasing the city's fire protection service fees charged to residents and businesses within the corporate limits of the city. Establishing tiered fees, providing for the administration, collection, and use of the fees raised hereby, and setting an effective date of July 1st, 2024. Um, as uh, the council is aware, uh, we were, uh, I was uh, instructed to provide for um, the following changes uh, in the fire fee. The residential flat uh, fire fee will. Uh, seven dollars and fifty cents per month um, and any commercial uh, structures the fire fee the monthly fees will be based upon the uh, annual gross receipts of the business located at the facility it establishes seven uh, different tiers between fifty thousand uh, dollars or less of uh, gross receipts 
and 2.5 million effectively and above. Uh, those, um, those fees are, and I'll mention them just for the benefit of anyone watching that doesn't have a, a copy uh, of the uh, draft ordinance uh, for them. So for facilities, uh, with annual gross receipts of $50,000 and less, the monthly fire fee would be $13. $50,001 one dollars to $150,000 would be $19 a month. $150,001 to $250,000 would be $25 a month. $250,001 to $500,000 would be $38 a month. $500,001 to $1 million would be $63 per month. A million one to $2.5 million would be $88 a month, and any um, business with gross receipts over $2.5 uh, million and $1 per year uh, and above would be charged a fire protection fee of $188 monthly. Um, all other substantive items on the uh, uh, on the existing fire service fee are unchanged except for abandoned uh, or vacant properties. Uh, those fees are where is that located? Um, right below that. Yep. Uh, Ten dollars. Oh no, I'm sorry. Fifteen. Fifteen. Fifteen I take yeah. that back. Fifteen dollars. Uh, per month for any commercial building or other structure that is unoccupied, unoccupied, vacant, or abandoned. All other uh, all other matters related to the fire service fees are unchanged uh, under the ordinance. Mm -hmm. so we'd be happy to take any questions on that. Any questions for Tom? Uh, Mayor has to step out. The, the state certification process with the sprinkler system, does that involve our local fire department in any shape or manner? Um, that is unchanged. It would. I, I don't know what our current practice is. Andy, I don't know if uh, you could speak to what our current practice is with respect to the fire. But then whatever it is today will be the process moving forward. This ordinance does not change that. I just didn't want to put our fire department in an inherently conflict kind of a situation with oh no that's not a certified system and you got to pay you know, more per month so, or whatever. Uh, they should have an annual inspection done on their sprinkler system in any business that has them but is that again is that done by the state fire marshal's office well the, they have a third party company that does that and they'll get a they'll get a certificate of, of, okay. of approval okay so yes good deal okay all right, are there any other questions regarding Ordinance 467? I just note uh, for the council's benefit, this is a three reading ordinance. Uh, this will also be, the text of this ordinance will also be published in its entirety with the uh, notice of public hearing that will take place on May 2nd uh, as well. The publication will take place, I think, next <laughs> month, uh, first of two. It's a class two legal ad um, and uh, this is set to uh, be enacted on third reading on May 2nd to take effect uh, on July 1st instead of uh, 30 days following. Okay. All right. Uh, at this time, under F1, I entertain a motion that we approve Ordinance 467 uh, relative to increasing the city's fire protection service fees. This will be on first reading. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Thomas, a second by Mr. Rigger. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Like sign opposed. That motion carries unanimously. Okay, we are down to ordinance number 468. This is relative to increasing the city's police protection service fees. Uh, this is on first reading. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the council has before it ordinance number 468 of the city of Buchanan, an ordinance amending ordinance number 224 of the city of Buchanan, increasing the city's police protection service fees charged to residents and businesses within the corporate limits, establishing tiered fees, providing for the administration, collection, and use of fees raised hereby, and setting an effective date of July 1st, 2024. Uh, note on uh, this one uh, that the city's police uh, protection fee has not been raised since April 1st of 1983, so just over uh, 41 years uh, ago. It uh, takes this. It takes a similar structure um, as the fire service fee, uh, as far as the ordinance goes. It imposes the same um, requirements on 
the uh, on property owners as the fire service fee. It establishes the same uh, tiered structure. The rates are different because the costs associated with providing uh, fire protection are different than those providing for providing police protection. So those monthly fees are, are less, and we'll go through those um, uh, briefly uh, as well. The uh, residential, the flat rate residential fee is, um, on this one is uh, $5 per month for residential. Um, and the same, uh, the same tiers uh, for commercial uh, as established in the uh, fire ordinance uh, are, again, $50,000 or less of gross receipts. The monthly fee would be $8, uh, $50,000 to $150,000 would be $16. One hundred fifty thousand to two hundred fifty thousand be twenty dollars. Two hundred fifty thousand to five hundred thousand be thirty dollars. Five hundred thousand to a million forty dollars a month. A million to two point five million be fifty dollars a month, and two point five million and above, one hundred sixty-seven dollars a month. Uh, similarly, for any unoccupied, vacant, or abandoned commercial buildings, the fee is a flat rate at fifteen dollars a month. Um, I note for the council's benefit that some language from the fire uh, ordinance got carried over to the police ordinance, and I'll be revising that for the uh, second reading uh, ordinance. That's not uh, that's not a, a problem uh, for tonight. But uh, similarly uh, to that, um, it's uh, taken to take effect on July 1st of uh, this year. It is again a three reading ordinance uh, with publication uh, of the ordinances in its entirety, a public hearing uh, before third reading on May 2nd, and then again, um, this is set to start at the new fiscal year. Be happy to take any questions. It would be appropriate to have a motion with appropriate changes. Yes, if you want. Yep. And in fact, if you want to look, it's on page, uh, page six there. This is in uh, Article <coughs> 4. Uh, section B, subparagraph 5, uh, that will just be stricken from the next. That has to do with the, uh, the discount language uh, that was carried over inadvertently from the uh, fire service. Uh, the sprinkle, sprinkle yeah. system. Yeah, the sprinkler system issue doesn't have anything to do with police, uh, police protection. Okay. <laughs> My mistake. Thank you. So a little scrubber our bases on those bricks. So it's all scrivener's <laughs> script, error. Yeah. error. I move that we accept the motion. You move that we uh, approve Ordinance 468, yep. uh, increasing the city's police protection service fees on first reading with the modification as Mr. O'Neill outlined in Section 5. That's correct. Okay. Mr. Thomas has made that motion. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Sanders has seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Could, aye. could we have brief discussion sure. first? Tom, did you happen to look at Ordinance uh, 224 as part of the preparation? I did. The, the sit, it's just about the time I started. So imagine a 24-year-old guy out of law school and now today. I mean, this is the first increase yes. in police fees since 1983. I did. The, the Ordinance 224 actually reduced because there was public outcry yep. about taking it to a dollar fifty a month or two dollars a month, so they rolled it back to a dollar fifty a month. Yep. So and it was pretty good. The original ordinance was two twenty one, and then it happened. It, then two twenty four had to come in to roll the fee back uh, slightly. Right. Again, that was forty one years ago. Yeah. At this point, I would say that uh, when you consider uh, this increase against uh, the rate of inflation, it, it should still be considered rollback. Uh, guess from that original time. Mr. Chair, I would only add that some folks in the community might think that we are being very cavalier about increasing these fees. Uh, so these are some of the tough things that council members have to do. And uh, think of it this way, the ISO rating went from, I five. think it was a level five. Well, when I started, it was even higher than a five. I remember when we got it down to five, and now it's all the way down to three. a three. And people have saved a lot of money on their fire insurance as a consequence of our agency being prepared to. So anyway. Well, uh, fire protection is a massive investment for the city. And uh, 
and with the costs associated with the Catholic Council sees that it's necessary in order to recoup some of those costs. Yeah. One way or the other, this is... That's all I got. Okay. Well, it's also, I think, over the years, by not increasing the uh, fire or the police fee, there are other areas of the community that have not been funded appropriately. And I think that will now be addressed. Um, you know, if you look at the infrastructure of our streets and sidewalks and so forth, that will be a major benefit uh, for that part of our community by having the having a more appropriate police fee and fire fee. And I, I still think at some time in the future, you know, I probably won't be around, but you know, some communities are having street fees today, and that's something might be looked at, you know, many years down the road, so to speak. That's it. All right, we have a motion and a second on the table. Um, is uh, can all those in favor please signify by saying aye? Aye. aye. Like sign opposed. That motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Hey, hey, hey. Jay is up. Jay's been busy this week you, uh, tracking busy. our our floodwaters that have uh, been around. Yes. The yes. city of Buckhannon fared very well. We dodged a bullet. Um, river uh, here in town crested at 22.2 feet, just below flood stage. We did not see any high water events within the corporate limits. So good job, Jay. Well, yes. <laughs> I, you know, I did not do a thing. Good evening, everyone. Well, how, um, about, how about the hail we had? Yeah, that was so we can blame that on him. So. <laughs> I will take that one. Uh, my, my topic of discussion is a FEMA flood mitigation assistance program called Swift Current, and it is a voluntary program between the city and some property owners. Um, and I'll get into that in a little bit to either elevate or demolish their structures. And I'm going to go over that um, rather quickly because there's not a lot of information as the mayor knows Amby and I and the mayor met as soon as we found out about this information about a week ago a week and a half ago and uh, more more to come on that but what I'm going to ask at the end if, if, the, if the council so decides is for you all to grant the mayor permission to enter into an agreement with FEMA and uh, the West Virginia Emergency Management Division to apply for and then proceed forward with this SWIFT current program. What this SWIFT current program does is provide a federal funding for uh, a percentage of um, the calls to elevate or demolish a structure. There's two caveats to it, and that's what we're always stressing in the CRS program. In order to be an eligible structure, you must carry an active flood uh, insurance policy, and you must have a history of repetitive losses. So with all of one third of Buckhannon being in the uh, floodplain, there's only tw between 25 and 30 structures that are el uh, eligible to participate in this program because some elect not to carry this flood insurance uh, policy and, and that's a, a big detriment. Uh, of those 25 to 30 uh, properties, they are all repetitive loss properties, which means FEMA will not fund 100% of it. It will be a 90-10 split. Um, FEMA will provide 90%, the property owner will provide, sorry, the structure owner will provide the other 10%. And the reason that is done is because the CDC has decided that we are a highly vulnerable, a social vulnerable county. Um, and the metrics that they use to come up with that numbers makes us eligible for the 90-10 split. The city would be responsible for paying for 90% of all the work done up front, and then just like the FEMA generator program, we would be reimbursed with that. The property owner would have to pick up that other 10% up front. The city will not carry them and then look to be reimbursed by the property owner. They have to pay their 10%, the city would cover the 90 and then later be reimbursed. Um, what West Virginia Emergency Management would like to do and, and, and this is something that, that Ambie and I feel would, is the right thing to do is, is to elevate those structures first and then as a, a later option, demolish them because as you know, that affects our, our tax base. Um, we have, and, and sorry, I forgot to say that th this information is in the last mm -hmm. five pages of right. our packet, but it's only six pages long, it's double-sided, so that, that will work out kind of nicely. And all this information, but it's highlighted on mine because it's easier to read. 
the city of Buckhannon does not have any severe repetitive loss structures. And I mentioned that earlier, i.e. nobody will, will get away with not having to contribute something to this project. Um, I talked about the 10%. If you go to the one with the house, that's, that's the breakdown. The, th the four houses across the top, we are not eligible again for the SRL, but we are subject and eligible for the two houses which describe that. Um, it, I think it will be a, a beneficial program if people continue to see the repetitive loss that, that's happened throughout uh, the last 35 years with all the floods. Um, I, I actually updated those numbers today for a report that is due to FEMA and of those repetitive loss structures, we're, and then for Buck Cannon it's a lot, we're almost at $500,000 in constantly paying out for the same flood damages over and over and over. Not the city of Buck Cannon paying okay, it, yeah. but FEMA right. paying out for right. the same uh, insurance claims for the same properties being flooded over and over and over, so they want to get those elevated or, or demolish them. The reason I, I am here is because this has been fast-tracked very quickly. Again, we found out about it a week and a half ago. The deadline for application is May 31st, but the West Virginia Emergency Management Division actually wants our application in by May 10th so that they can review it and come back with us with any questions. Um, if the grant is approved, and according to the project manager that I am speaking with due to Buck Cannon's uh, small number of repetitive loss structures and the amount of money that's out there. He does not think that we will not get this grant. Uh, it would be two years from the time we are given notice of award to design, uh, provide project management, project oversight, uh, become the grant administrator, oversee everything. We have two years to complete those structures but we shouldn't expect a notice to proceed until late summer or early fall of 2024. Um, again, I'm asking that the council consider and, and authorize the mayor to enter into an agreement with the Federal uh, Emergency Management Association as well as the West Virginia Emergency Management Division to assist in either the elevating of or the demolition of repetitive, the 25 to 30 repetitive loss structures in Buckhannon. Uh, as part of that, in that three and a half, four weeks time frame that I've got to get this grant in, we and the mayor's uh, authorized it, I, the city would become the sub-recipient again, which basically it's just like with the FEMA grants, I will be doing, well, the city of Buckhannon will be doing all the project administration, designing of calls, inquiries, getting estimates, uh, helping the uh, property owners select contractors, the bidding process, all that. Um, and we'd also have to do the application that is required. And um, th that is it in a real quick nutshell. I wish I, you know, and if there's questions that are asked, of course I'll entertain them to the best, but there's not a lot out there at this moment on this. But we found out about it because a, a property owner received a letter on uh, March 20. 20th, and, and I was at a conference in uh, Charleston and wasn't even aware of these letters going out or anything, and it's no fault of the cities, but uh, FEMA sent that information to uh, the West Virginia Emergency Management Division with such a t short timeline that they had to immediately turn it out. The repetitive lost property owners got the information before I did. They were calling to question if this was a joke, if this was a scam, but no, this is a, 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 a true project. Again, only 26 property, 25 to 30. Right now, my count is 26. West Virginia Emergency Management Division and FEMA have a different number because they're not counting some structures that have been demolished, even though I've notified them for four years in a row. Uh, so that's kind of where we are, but um, that's that's it. In what would be the potential? So we would front the money for these projects? No. You're no. saying yes. You're saying no. no. No, we wouldn't front the money for it. They would, they would uh, pay for that. That's, uh, that's not the way I'm understanding. Right, that's not the way I understood it. It's not the way I understood So, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll get a clarification on that. Yeah. But when I was talking to Tim Keaton on, well, matter of fact, yesterday afternoon, is the city, just like with the FEMA grants, the city fronts the money and then sends in the invoices to seek reimbursement. So, begs the question, what type 
of estimation would you have and even of the amount of money that would be funding and where would it come from? General fund? No, it would have to be general fund. Yeah. I, if it's, you said the deadline is May 4th, correct? No, May 10th May for 10th. our submission. I would suggest that we not take action on this tonight. You've given us a lot of information. <laughs> I think it's good information. I appreciate you being here tonight. I think give us some time to for you to get the clarification you need and then perhaps we can have what we need to take action on it at our April 18th Thank meeting. You. Is that we need that clarification? I, I agree. I don't want to. I don't want to buy a pig and a poke here, and and us uh, front money that we don't necessarily have. That'll be my first question tomorrow. <laughs> right. I'll let, we'll let you and Amby work on that. You yes. work on that and get with Amby and so forth. But that's a big question. I mean, Amby's dealt with it in the past on a different program. But my my specific question to him yesterday was, we will well, front it yeah. and we will be reimbursed. And your head went like this and her head well, went like that. Well, we I mean, that. you know, there's a lot to think about with this. That's 26 yeah. properties. And if you're talking elevation or demolition, that's you can't do anything with those properties Correct. unless you demolish right. them. And then and, and, and you, we look at like our North Buchanan Riverfront Park. Even though we've established a park over there, there are still some of those parcels we are very limited in what we can and cannot do. I mean, we can't even put blacktop in certain areas or put even park equipment in certain areas because it changes how the water would flow across those properties. And we, as we know with flood, floodplain uh, uh, locations, we can't change uh, elevations on neighboring properties because it affects neighboring properties. So Amby's 100% correct. This, and we, we're, this is a small community. I mean, we, we want to keep as many properties on tax rolls as we possibly can. Uh, 26 properties will be heavily felt if, that's, if, if that ultimately happens. And, and the, you know, to add to that, Mayor, the emergency man West Virginia Emergency Management Division, you know, their recommendation to both the city, the property owners, and the FEMA will be elevate first mm -hmm. and then demo right. if, you know, it is a voluntary participation of those 25 to 30, 85 only participate. You know, some may like it just the way they are and don't want to participate. Uh, maybe the 10% match is, is a too much, but, but more to come. Let's research it. Yeah, okay. yeah, given Mr. Sanders' question, I think we it would be uh, appropriate for us to take no action this evening, research, and come back on the April 18th meeting for for uh, action uh, either way at that point. Bobby, did you want a motion to table? To we can. I would move that we table until the 18th. Second. Second, Second by Mr. Rigger. I'll give it to him this evening. We have uh, Macaulay first and then Rigger second. All those in fav favor of uh, taking no action until April 18th on F3, please signify by saying aye. 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 That like sign opposed? Motion carries unanimously. That's Thank you, sir. Have. Yes. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jerry. I'm going to slide out the side door. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm going to email. <laughs> If you want to see more water, I hear it's still up in Pittsburgh. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go to council comments and announcements. Uh, Mrs. Bucklew is not here this evening. She, uh, she might be at play practice. Uh, sure is, yeah. And so we've got uh, Mr. McCauley. I just follow up on my previous comment that this council is not being cavalier with the police and fire fees. It's something that we've been talking about for years. And uh, as Councilman Thomas noted, the bite at the apple that every year it seems we budget more and more dollars and cents for our police and fire departments. And we have this limited general fund, which greatly inhibits our ability to pave more streets and build more sidewalks and put more playground equipment out and develop the park. So this will allow us to do that. That's all I got. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rigger. I don't have anything. To know. All right. No pontifications from you? you? Saved them all for Thomas, didn't you? Thomas, you're up. Well, I need about 10 minutes, but I have no comments. All right, well, let's all leave. But <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you, David. Uh, Mr. Rylands is not here. Mr. Sanders. Very quickly, just follow up on some uh, emails that have been sending out to the media and to our email list. Uh, now it's mowing season, so per code, you know, you, you need to keep up with your mowing, keep your lawn looking attractive at the same time. You know, the mayor talked about putting the stone and gravel from the cinders out into the street for the street sweeper to get. Now, that does not include grass clippings. So you must clean your grass clippings back and dispose of them properly. 
So you can call City Hall and find out when there'll be yard debris pickups on that. But do not put your grass clippings in the street. They wash into the drains, and then we end up getting clogged up, and we have to dig those drains out. Good clarification. Yes. And swimming pools, you know, if you have a swimming pool or you're putting a swimming pool in, make sure you get the proper permits and you have the right fencing. I sent a news release out earlier, as did uh, the, some of the county folks, about a demolition that will take place on Monday, April 8th. This is not a city project. Let me stress that. This is not a city project, but it will affect, <coughs> affect the city greatly, the traffic in the city. That's why the city, along with the county, put this information out. So please understand, we're not doing the demolition. It's a private company that the Upper County Commission has contracted to do that, but it will affect traffic beginning at 8 a.m. Monday until 4 p.m. There'll be flaggers out there. There'll be one lane of traffic on Locust Street coming up past the courthouse. And finally, we have uh, the free paper shred event coming up on Saturday, April 20th for residential shredding. So if you're a resident, you have some papers that you need to get shredded. Uh, it is on the property across from the transfer station, the Mudlick property that we have, and it's uh, being sponsored by the Upper County Solid Waste Authority. We thank them for the partnership. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you, sir. Um, this morning, I know I've gotten some uh, questions um, we, uh, about, about the city property uh, mowing. Um, this morning, we um, awarded uh, the, the bid winner for uh, the apparent low bidder for our uh, city properties. Uh, that would include the properties that the city owns as well as the median on Camden Avenue. Um, we mow that, uh, so that, that will begin to take place next week um, uh, as it does at this time every year. Um, we know the grass is uh, quickly getting high and all this rain doesn't help. So um, we will be getting to mowing uh, parks and um, the cemetery and uh, our, our, all of our city properties and the median on Camden here as soon as it starts to dry up next week. I um, want to uh, make a quick note. Um, <clears throat> I've reached out to more mayors than I care to this week because of the uh, terrible weather that our state uh, received in the last uh, couple days. Charleston, Huntington, uh, Barbersville, um, Dunbar, St. Albans, all were hit very hard. And then of course uh, the Fayette County uh, area, the uh, Heiko area actually was confirmed today that an EF2 tornado um, with winds uh, tapping out at 130 miles an hour uh, actually touched down there. If you know where that is, it's in pretty rugged territory. It's four and a half miles from the New River Gorge Bridge. So if it can happen there, it can happen anywhere. So uh, anytime we put out a uh, weather aware uh, notice on our Facebook page and through uh, Upshur County Emergency Management, please take those notices seriously. We, it's a myth that we can't get tornadoes. We absolutely can get tornadoes. It has nothing to do with topography. It has everything to do with the wind, the wind shears, uh, cold air and warm air coming together to create the, uh, the spin. Um, so we, we absolutely can uh, receive a tornado here. And uh, with climate shift and climate change, you never know. So West Virginia is starting to see some more turbulent weather, and I hope that's not a trend. Uh, but with that, please keep our neighbors in the southern part of the state in your thoughts and prayers as they recover from those awful storms. And we, uh, we thank the good Lord above here that we did not, that we spent, we dodged a bullet here in the north central part of the state. So uh, with that, I hope everyone has a great evening, great weekend, and I consider us adjourned at 8.09.